Hey team, this is Velasquez. So here we are with part two of our migration review lecture. And I titled this half of the lecture, which is looking at laws of migration. All right, so in your chapter three reading guide, I wanted to hit first before we begin, um, they talk about something called migration transition. So definitely for unit two or unit three, excuse me, chapter two, we looked at through population, which is known as the demographic transition model. If this looks a little blurry or a little fuzzy, or you don't completely understand what's happening with these lines, um, that's definitely something to address before this week's exam. So we talked about stage one, where we have high and um, high birth rate and death rates. And again, for various changes, we see a decline in the death rate in stage two, which is high growth for population. Stage three, we see finally the birth rate catching up for various reasons, which we look at extensively. And then stage four into stage five, we have that decline as well as low growth population. All right, so with that review, when we look at migration transition, uh, Zelensky, which is the geographer that kind of you know, put some ideas behind this, he proposed that changes in society are comparable with those in the demographic transition. Remember, transition means what's changing, what's shifting in that case. So migration transition, transition excuse me, results from the social and economic changes that are produced in the demographic transition model. So in stage one, we can see again, um, in the demographic transition, we just mentioned high birth rates and high death rates. Uh, migration transition is high daily or seasonal mobility, right? In this case, we said one of the reasons why the death rate was so high is the um, uh, trouble finding a stable food supply, right? So we see that hunters and gatherers, right, they would migrate and move around um, trying to um, locate that food supply. In stage two of the DTM, we see that high birth rate, but we do see the decline in the CDR, the crude death rate. So high international immigration and interregional migration from rural to urban areas, right? We said part of stage two, right, is we see that the food supply is um, improving. We see that when we looked at, for example, England with the agriculture revolution transitioning into an early industrial revolution. So we see that shift from the farm, possibly to working in factories or the city environments. Stage three of the DTM has that uh, declining birth rate and declining death rate. And for migration transition, high international immigration and interregional migration from the cities to the suburbs. Okay, so we looked at that in intra-regional, right? We're looking at uh, inside the same region. So we see that shift we mentioned, which is looking from um, cities for various reasons. Again, looking for a small family uh, home in the suburbs. Okay, and then uh, we also see that for stage four. Okay, so um, in your reading guide, there is a few boxes. Um, your cultural landscape goes into a little more background, but I just want to hit that directly, that you should be familiar with migration transition as well. Okay, another um, migration law, we should say, and what I'm going to be referring to is Ravenstein's Laws of Migration. So there's basic patterns, right? And all our models, uh, we look at patterns are a way for us to understand what's happening in the world, right? We're trying to ask questions where things are happening and why they're happening there. In regards to migration, one of the things we see a pattern that we can recognize laws of migration is that migrants travel relatively short distances. And this really ties back to our discussion of distance decay, right? Distance decay was one of our unit one concepts and that simple sort of line graph on the screen basically breaks down the farther you get away from something, the less the spatial interaction. Now there's the two ways we can kind of really um, understand this, right? Um, number one, it weighs in the decision to migrate. So the farther away we are from something, right, we, we know less about it. So that might uh, defer us, the fact that we won't migrate as far. Right. If I'm thinking about, hmm, I'm looking for a new job, where would I like to go? Well, let me see, Nevada might be a nice place. It's relatively close by, it's similar climate, um, it's in the same country, right? I might choose to migrate there. If I'm deciding to, hmm, I wanna migrate, I think I want to move to Tokyo, right? That's a big jump, right? And I might have some general sense of what Tokyo is like, but on a daily basis, right? That's not something that's really something I'm thinking about or interacting with, so that could deter 
my fact that I might take that giant leap, right? Might have less interaction or less likely to move there. Okay, so we also see the fact that migrants tend to um, migrate farther uh, or shorter distances, excuse me, because they also want to maintain that interaction with maybe family ties. So we talked about the concept of distance decay when we analyzed the map of uh, Mexican migration up to the United States, right? We looked at there's patterns that they are close to the border in the southwest. Now there's a bunch of different reasons we could play with. But one of the ones that we played with was the fact that that distance decay, right? That most migrants are able to still have those connections with their family uh, back in Mexico, maybe visiting for holidays, visiting relatives. So in general, one of the patterns we recognize in general volunteer migration, we see that they travel short distances. Okay, another pattern or law of migration we could identify is that most migrants will travel to urban areas. And this just goes back to, right, more pull opportunities. So if we think about what's located in cities, right, jobs, opportunity, we see also in our first half of the lecture, we talked about enclaves, right? There might be similar cultures due to chain migration that might link you to a major urban setting. So I might more likely to settle maybe out in California or New York City or Portland, Seattle versus right smack in the middle of Montana, right? We also can tie this um, to a discussion of the gravity model. So the gravity model, right, gravity is something that pulls you, right? If you throw something in the air, right, it falls on the ground, and that's that pull, that's scientific. If we're applying it to things like migration, we're basically saying that a city, right, has more of a pull. It has more of a force. If I'm going to move over, if I'm in California, right, I may be pulled to Los Angeles or San Francisco because of all those opportunities that are offered in the city, Okay. We also say the closer you get to that city, it might have more of a pull in that case. Okay, so this is just one. We looked at sanctuary cities um, uh, within different states, right? So there's some other reasons why cities can be a pull factor. But we, one of the patterns we recognize is we can see that most migrants are settling in urban areas. Now, here's a map to take a look at, okay, so if we're looking at um, concept of distance decay, if we're looking at gravity model, so one of our optional case studies to take a look at is looking at Cuban migration, okay, so we see that the increase and we look at percentage of Cuban migrants across um, map of the United States, so if we look at Cuba, right, um, Cuban refugees, especially after um, we look at the communist revolution in uh, Fidel Castro, and we look a little back history in this case, we see most migrants right relatively short distance into Miami. And Miami, again, has a pull factor because of the jobs, opportunities, and the urban environment. Okay, one more thing that we also want to introduce when we look at patterns of migration is that we see that in general, migration will occur in steps. So looking at step migration, migrants eventually reach a destination through a, a series of small moves. So for example, let's say if we're looking back at um, the discussion of Brazil, right? if we're talking about that rural to urban migration, it's less likely that a migrant is gonna be living in the middle of a remote area and then just boom, all of a sudden just go straight to Rio de Janeiro. Chances are they'll probably migrate to a local town, maybe a village, maybe a, a smaller city, and step by step they might be able to sort of make their way to that particular um, destination. Now in the process, right, there could be different things that prevent that migrant from getting to their final destination, so to speak. There can be things like intervening obstacles, right, things that get in their way, something that prevents them. Or we can also, as geographers, we can talk about things called intervening opportunities, right? There might, all of a sudden, I might be on my way to Rio de Janeiro, but I might stop in a town and, you know, I get a wonderful job and I decide, no, I think I'm going to stay here and settle in. Or maybe I fall in love, magic, okay? So there might be things on the way that might deter that step migration. Okay, so as a pattern, according to Ravenstein, we do see migrants take relatively small steps. Okay, we've hit this as well. Okay, another pattern we recognize is rural to urban. Most migration history has been rural to urban. And we even tie that way back to our discussion of the Industrial Revolution. Okay, youth and gender come into play. We see most migrants tend to be young, 
Uh, international migration, we see more migrants tend to be male. We can think about why, right? Especially when it comes to being young. We can think about young people, they might have a little more adventure, they might be in the market to um, you know, have a new opportunity or maybe you know, try something out new. Uh, young people in general have less ties, right? If you're older, you might have own a home or you might have children or you might be in your career for some time, right? You might be more hesitant to take a move. So migration occurs mostly for young people. International scale, we see more males and think about perhaps why it's a little more dangerous for females, right, to migrate alone, especially on international scale, especially when we go back to forced migration, human trafficking. Sad to say, it's very difficult um, looking at the differences between the two genders. Uh, internal, however, we do see female migration. Okay, so Ravenstein recognized that as more of an internal scale. The last thing that I want to introduce in this case, and this is really where your case studies fall in, this is not a history class, however, comma, you should be relatively familiar with the different waves, we call it, of migration in U.S. history. Okay, so some of you are choosing to do your case study right on the forced migration of enslaved Africans, for example, way back in the 1500s, all the way up to the 1800s. Um, in the early 1800s, we really focus a lot of migration comes from the northern half of Western Europe. So this is where we're looking at migrants, for example, immigrants from Germany, and we also look from Ireland. If we look at push factors, like back in Ireland, the Irish potato famine, where people were starving, right? That's a powerful push factor of Irish people trying to come into the United States. Later on in the late 1800s, early 1900s, we have more migrants coming from Southern and Eastern Europe. Um, so for example, um, Italy or Mediterranean areas. And then later on, some of you are also choosing to do your case study looking at Cuba or looking at Vietnam. Um, so more 1945 to the present, we see a shift. We have less immigration coming over from Europe and we have more immigration coming up from Latin America and also different parts of Asia. Of liberty, the one that reads in part, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. That's some lofty stuff, right? Well, sentiment aside, immigrants are good for the economy. <laughs> Before we get into the economics of immigration, let's step back and have a quick look at the history. Homo sapiens have been moving around the planet for a long, long time. Estimates vary, but modern humans started to spread out from Africa between 80,000 and 60,000 years ago. And since then, they've been busily migrating all over the globe. By 12,000 years ago, we were on all the continents except Antarctica. Because Antarctica is a terrible place to live if you aren't a penguin. And honestly, even they seem unhappy there. Today, we're going to look at international migration, when people move between countries, rather than internal migration, which refers to people moving around within their home country. Because international migration has the most appreciable economic effect. We're also not going to talk about forced migrations, like the Atlantic slave trade that kidnapped many million Africans and transported them to the Americas as chattel between the 16th and 19th century. We're going to focus on voluntary migration because people who choose to move internationally are very often seeking economic opportunity. In 1889, a geographer named George Robinstein wrote in his Laws of Migration, Bad or oppressive laws, heavy taxation, an unattractive climate, uncongenial social surroundings, and even compulsion all have produced and are still producing currents of migration. But none of these currents can compare in volume with that which arises from the desire inherent in most men to better themselves in material respects. Ravenstein was writing during the Great Atlantic Migration, which began in the 1840s as huge numbers of Europeans relocated to the Americas. Between 1880 and 1910 alone, Alone, somewhere in the neighborhood of 17 million Europeans arrived in the United States. The 19th century also saw a smaller but still significant number of Asian immigrants arrive in the U.S., mostly settling on the West Coast. Many of them came to join in the gold rush, working as laborers in the mines. They also worked in factories and helped build the Transcontinental Railroad. All this immigration was, in many ways, a result of technological advances. Improved transportation like steamships reduced the cost and difficulty of migrating across the Atlantic, and the rapidly growing industries of the United States 